This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. How's it going? My name is Kurt. I'm John Bishop. And welcome to uh, the August 2012 Boston WordPress Meetup, also known as the WordCamp Aftermath. If you arrived early enough, you were able to get some free t-shirts. If you're not, there'll be more next month. So if you want, come early, we'll be giving them away. Uh, you guys all have raffle tickets, and we'll be giving that away shortly as well. Who here actually went to WordCamp? Raise your hand. Awesome. Who here is new? Even awesome. Wow, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. We meet here once a month, last Monday of every month. Uh, the Wi-Fi code, if you if you haven't already, it's on the Cambridge network. It's WP0827. You can find us at thebostonwp.org, at bostonwp on Twitter, hashtag bostonwp. Uh, we're going to go over our sponsors. Uh, first one's Microsoft Nerd. Um, they've been giving us this venue since April of 2009. Uh, AV Wi-Fi, they've given us pizza, and now uh, we have sponsors, and and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. So we'd also like to thank HostGator. Uh, cheaper hosting with limited, unlimited storage. Um, we use them currently for the Boston WordPress site. They're great, easy, one-click install. We use them when we do our um, uh, session workshops. Uh, but if you do want to sign up, we have uh, this code at the bottom, Boston WP Meetup, for a 25% discount. So uh, check that out if you guys are interested. We also have a new sponsor this month, and actually for the rest of the year, it's WP Engine. Um, for those of you who are at WordCamp, you might have signed up for their lifetime free hosting account. Who did? Great, because we're wrapping off an additional five free hosting packages for life tonight. So I'm going to pick five numbers. If you guys want to come find me during the break, uh, during one of the breaks, we'll have two, one after opening remarks and one after the first talk. Um, so find me and I'll, I'll get you set up with the coupon. So well, I'm going to draw the first number here, and John can pick the next one. All right, guys. Eight four five one two four. Ooh. Really? Awesome. So, eight four five. Eight four five one two four. All right, you're gonna have to come see me afterwards. There you go. Eight four five zero nine two. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. Sit right around here. Eight four five one zero six. Eight four five one one two. Last week. I'm going to count that. Just kidding. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, it's serious. Uh, eight four five. Zero nine zero. I think that's mine. I think it's mine. I keep reading. No, Matt, you know, Matt, Matt, you just qualify. Um, eight four five one two five. Right here. All right. Just come see me in a little bit. Yes, we have I I have all the information for you guys. Congratulations. If you guys are interested, we are giving another five away next month. So keep coming. <laughs> T-shirts, more giveaways. Do we need to keep our ticket? You can bring it if you want. So, so, so this month, our pizza sponsor is actually us two. So one. We want to welcome all the new Boston WordPress members. Uh, typically, once a month, we get sponsors, uh, corporate sponsors, to give us uh, some funds so that we can buy pizza for you guys. Um, we weren't able to get any this month, so we decided to pay for it. Um, moving forward, uh, if we can't find any sponsors, there won't be pizza. So we're, you know, keep tuned on the meetup.com page. Uh, we'll be putting up an agenda. You know, hopefully, if we get pizza, then we'll, we'll alter it. If not, then it's still the same time, just the, the schedules for the talks will start a little bit. And early. it's a great opportunity to get your name out, uh, whether it's for recruiting or whether you're just trying to reach a tech savvy audience. Um, 
and the entire month we push you guys on Twitter, Boston Tweet Up retweets us, and uh, it's just some pretty good exposure. So, so I know. Yes, question. What, what is it for cost for pizza for for really four people? It's about three hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, so usually, um, the companies who sponsors uh, they usually have uh, you know some 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 message to say. I know Ten Up is hiring. So who else is hiring, by the way? Can can you guys stand up, please? No, mm -hmm. you going first. No. Hey, hey everybody, um, I'm with Oom, along with my uh, oh. co-worker Jim here. Um, we're a WordPress development shop here in Cambridge. We also have an office in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we pretty much uh, make most of our uh, business on WordPress. We do everything from small mom and pop shops all the way up to big companies like NBC, Venture Me, um, we can do some work CBS, Intuit. Um, if anybody freelancing looking for a change, um, it's a small shop, very close community. Um, I think everybody loves what they do. If you're a small business owner, give us a talk. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, uh, please come introduce yourself. Okay. Um, I'm Jonathan Stiebel. Um, I have a startup company that does online education, um, and we're looking for people who want to help with internet marketing in particular. Uh, my name is Josh Bialkoff. I have a company called Forward Jump Marketing. It's forwardjump.com. We're looking for WordPress developers and people who can train uh, people in WordPress and how to use WordPress. Mm -hmm. uh, Kerry Power with uh, Venture Activism, and we are also looking for um, WordPress experts and also entry level people to work with the experts um, to bump out uh, a product that we call a web 2.0 facelift. Uh, it's geared towards uh, small to mid-sized companies. It's WordPress based um, and uh, many of them grow into uh, WordPress applications. So. Where is it located? Uh, Kenmore Square. Thank you. Yep. So, Alongside that, you know, we also have a website, which we'll get to in a little bit. We also have a jobs board there. We'll go over that in a little more detail. So a little bit about us. Uh, we're currently the second largest WordPress meetup in the world with uh, 4,450 plus members. Andy's interrupt. So we have Andy here from uh, uh, the New York City WordPress. Oh, that's where you're from. So. <laughs> So they're actually the only ones larger than us. They're the number one in the world. By like, yeah. Well, yeah. Twice. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're on our way there. Yeah, you're... <clears throat> yeah. So tell 200 of your friends each. Where would we go to find out information about the New York Times? I'm just curious. They're at meetup.com. We also have WPNYC. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're growing every day, um, obviously. Um, and right now it's just me and Kurt uh, doing everything from workshops to the website to this on WordCamp. So uh, anybody's interested in helping with any part of that, whether it's a sponsorship, speaking, or actually helping with the meetup, um, uh, come up and talk to one of us or uh, send us an email um, and we'll get back to you and um, we welcome it. All right, so our, our site, bostonwp.org, uh, all, all of these meetups are recorded, past videos, archives, um, slides are up on our, our blog page. Um, we also have the jobs board for freelancers or people looking for, for work or looking for help. Uh, we're, su we're still working on the forums right now, and John is also working on the new GitHub site. For so, so one of the things that we wanted to do is uh, we have a very diverse group of people here um, beginners to developers, and we try to cover as many, you know, a nice range of topics during each uh, meetup, but we want to do a little bit more outside of that, so I thought it'd be cool to set up a Boston WP GitHub account um, and come up with some community plugins that we can all contribute to and work together on. Uh, so we have some basic ideas of some stuff we want to throw up there, but if you guys are interested um, in contributing or have some ideas, uh, come up to me after the meetup um, or send me an email uh, and we can talk more about it. Uh, but on top of that, we're hoping to do more outside of this meetup, whether it's uh, hackathons or just getting together and drinking and talking WordPress <laughs> and development and stuff. But uh, 
we want to do more with development in the community in Boston and kind of have a revolver on Boston with UP. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, if you have any questions, you want to help out with that, or you want to hear more about the GitHub stuff, come and talk to me and uh, we'll figure some stuff out. Uh, I'm just wondering if I could put in a plug for Gene. If anybody uh, wants to go from WordPress beginner to getting much more experience, the key to that is learning PHP. And uh, PHP Boston is starting a PHP Percolate season four next week. Uh, and I told Gene he was aiming for 100 signups. He's got 101. I told him I think there should be at least 200 with 100 finishing. So you might want to check that out. It's uh, basically a self-study. Go through the book, put them up yourself, and uh, it's a great way to get your feet wet with PHP if you're not already familiar with it. Definitely. Just uh, go to uh, PHP Boston on Meetup or, or phpboston.org, I think. Also, it's a very similar, really parallel, a lot of overlap between these two, and uh, a lot of good people uh, on both, both pieces of it. So. Is there another question down there? So WordCamp Boston 2012, uh, thank you guys for all those who came. Uh, all the videos are up, uh, wordpress.tv slash event slash WordCamp Python Boston Python 2012. We'll also send, a, send an email out about that. Um, if you haven't already, you can also find the speakers at speaker rate. Be sure to rate them, let them know how they do. We'll be following up with them, see what hits or misses that they had. Um, and as soon as I can get a hold of Automatic, We'll also release some of the financials um, and some of the, the ongoing behind the scenes as a final report. There's also WordCamp Providence 2012, which is coming up on October 27th. It's going to be one day, Saturday, from 8 to 6 p.m., uh, University of Rhode Island, Providence campus. Uh, you can visit 2012.providence.wordcamp.org for more information. I, I don't know if they're looking for speakers or not. Uh, they are. So if you're interested in speaking, uh, feel free to send me an email. Is that for free or do you have to pay for it? Uh, I think you have to pay for it. You can speak for free. You can speak, yeah. Where are you sponsor for free? Oh. Well, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So here are our sessions. We're going to start off with William. He's going to be giving a talk on how to secure IP rights created through, oh, that's a typo, through your WordPress website. <laughs> Uh, and then we also have Andy, where is he? He's over there. He's talking about minimum value viable products and WordPress. Well, I can't think of a better way to spend one of the last summer evenings here in Boston than at a WordPress meetup group. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> we are thrilled to be here. Um, my husband, uh, Pat Attorney William Mansfield, and I do attend these meetings, and we were very surprised and encouraged when Kurt approached me a few months ago and said that several attendees have had questions about intellectual property and how to protect their work and their copyrights um, and asked if we would like to give some information and speak. I said, certainly. So as I mentioned, I am a co-founder of a startup that does use WordPress and some of the startups that William works with also uses WordPress. So by attending this these types of meetups, we're educating ourselves also is learning about the pain points that WordPress developers are going through. And uh, education is key. I just want to highlight there are two opportunities that we will be offering and a, another IP attorney coming up. We will be offering uh, monthly meetings in our Winchester Center office called um, Everything you wanted to know about law for entrepreneurship, but was too expensive to ask. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, see me afterwards, which on your mailing list. And there's also um, an intellectual property attorney here, Kelly Cora, and she is starting um, to offer webinars. I believe the first one is September 27. The first webinar is this Wednesday. Oh. Um, this Wednesday. This Wednesday, Trademarks 101. Um, and the next four weeks, there'll be trademarks, copyrights, patents, and trade secrets. And then there's a live workshop on the 27th. Oh, okay, the live workshop on the 27th, but the first <coughs> webinar is this Wednesday. So if you're interested in that, there's also a, a complimentary discount code that um, by attending this meeting, um, she will give that to you. So please see her afterwards. 
How many people have heard about the four P's of marketing? A few people of marketing. Okay. So just as there are four P's in marketing, we see that there are four P's in entrepreneurship. The first P is uh, for people, because without people like you, we wouldn't be here. The second P stands for place, for places such as the Microsoft Nerd Center, because they offer a terrific venue for spring community and entrepreneurship. And the third P is the passion, because if it wasn't for our passions, we wouldn't be here, and Kurt and John would not be working their day gigs and also nights and weekends to make this happen. And the fourth P we see as patents, because patents and intellectual property are the backbone and um, patent attorney William, his uh, passion for patents began as a young man helping his dad, an inventor, um, work on intellectual property and patents, and he's now living his dream. So without further ado, here's my business partner and life partner, patent attorney William Mansfield. <laughs> So the purpose of the talk mainly was to discuss issues that people who have WordPress sites and are planning to start businesses would need to know, um, and uh, certainly we'd like to hear what everyone has to say at the end in terms of any kind of questions that come up. So uh, these are 10 things that, that you should think about for sure. Uh, first, uh, formalizing ownership agreements among the founders. Uh, people oftentimes have goodwill at the beginning and things sour later. Having it all in writing is the best course. Um, next, um, you should file patents on things that are critical to your business, uh, and this will enable you to get investment. I've met with many people who said that VCs wanted to hear that they had some kind of barriers to entry, and this is a good barrier to entry. Um, the next thing is, um, when talking with investors or other people, potential employees, contractors, don't discuss the quote unquote secret sauce, uh, except under NDA, and uh, as we all know, investors will not sign NDAs, therefore you should file a patent first, then you can talk to them, and then if they steal your idea, you can sue them successfully. Um, you should start with a provisional patent first, usually, because uh, it's cheaper, uh, takes less time to do it, and you get uh, your priority date, and as long as you're not selling it making a lot of money now, you end up getting an extra year at the end when you are selling it, which is good for you. Uh, the next thing I would say in terms of uh, websites, particularly WordPress, uh, is to put copyright notices on everything that you do not want copied. Of course, that will not prevent it from being copied, but you'll be able to trace it better. Uh, and keeping ownership clear in terms of hiring people and contractors. You should make sure that they assign all the rights to the code that they do for you to the company uh, so that they later on can't uh, hold you ransom at a later point. You should register your copyright because it's absolutely true, as I'm sure many of you know, that you get a copyright as soon as you create code or anything. But uh, you get your maximum legal protection if you register it because you are automatically putting the world on notice, even if people didn't actually notice. They can't say that they're an innocent infringer in court. And uh, you get statutory damages, which is oftentimes higher than what you can prove. And you don't have to spend the time proving it. So that's nice. Uh, trademark registration. Uh, you should definitely register your domain name, you know, whatever brand that you want to um, preserve for your own use, you should get a trademark registration. And uh, you can start using TM right away, uh, anyone can do that, um, but uh, it's better to register it because it gives you nationwide protection. And then uh, you should protect your domain names and your social media usernames. Uh, as soon as you come up with um, a certain domain, be it .net, .co, anything, course.com, you should uh, go ahead and get that uh, domain, even if you don't use it a lot right now, because <coughs> later on somebody else will probably start using it. Will you take questions? Sure, we go on or why don't I do that, yeah. So, so on that last point, um, should we just register it through our domain registrar, or are you saying we need to uh, uh, actually do something else and fill up some other papers and, and register it somewhere else? 
No, I'm just saying like the ICANN process. You should do that. You should register it. And uh, of course, sometimes people get into disputes over that. And there's a whole procedure for this, resolving those under the UDRAP. And I guess the other thing, the connection with trademark, is that if you have a domain name, and then you can uh, get a trademark more easily. And the other way too, if you first get a trademark, and you have someone else who's already using the domain name to <coughs> the trademark, you can then force them to stop using it, because you have the trademark. So. How do you register for a trademark? Mm -hmm. How do you register for a trademark? Yeah. Um, and to our copyright. Same, oh, there's two different offices for that. Um, the uh, USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, does patents and trademarks, as the name implies. But the copyright office is separate. Uh, so those are the two offices that you would apply to to get that done. Can you say that again? Sorry. There's a copyright office for the copyright part, and there's a trademark and patent office for the others. It very simply, what is the process for each one? Uh, well, uh, for copyright... Well, uh, I think you... um, the the processes can be kind of complicated. I I think uh, maybe we should continue version. with the presentation. And oh, then we if that'll be covered in the presentation? Before. Well, I, I'm... I think there's something prepared. She's just cautioning him not to tell us too much. Well, I don't know. Well, the thing is that he has a presentation. We have to hire an attorney. He has a presentation about intellectual property. But I think you have a really quick answer. We, we can see yeah. who the business person in the family is. Uh, the copyright answer is that uh, you just fill out a small amount of paperwork, doesn't take that long, doesn't cost that much. The main issue, as with all these things, why you might hire an attorney is to make sure that there isn't anybody in the world who's already using it. But to, just, to do it yourself doesn't cost that much, but you are running the risk that you missed something because yeah. you didn't search thoroughly enough. Uh, and the same procedure, but it takes longer for the trademark, it's about a year or so to get a trademark, assuming no major problems. <coughs> uh, and the patent takes significantly longer, usually around, at least the shortest I've heard is like three years. There is a procedure for acceleration which takes less time. It can be like a year. Can you put hands on a trademark that's already been previously issued? Yes, you can. If you have a valid claim to it. You can do that. There is a procedure for that, trying to challenge someone's mark, yeah. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes not, but certainly you can do that. Cool. Now, this is <coughs> okay, good. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this was an interesting point that I thought I would mention that comes up a lot with companies, startups, that you should, if you're hiring people, and of course if you're an employee, you should, you should notice that you're giving away your, your rights. Uh, in the assignment for IP rights, basically they describe every type of thing that could be considered an invention, and they say that uh, it's assigned to the company, and that uh, anything that you come up with, even a year after you leave, uh, as long as it was derived from the work you did at the company, uh, they own it. That's pretty much what that means. They also have often ask you to sign something when you get hired, saying that you're not violating any previous um, NDA or other agreement that you've made with another company. So, um, as we've mentioned, the various types of IP include copyright, trademark, trade dress, which is just a form of copyright. It has to do with the shape of packaging. And a domain name registration. And the, I guess the main reason I mention that is because some people think if you get a trademark, you automatically have the domain. You don't. You have to do both. Uh, certainly helps getting the domain if you already have the trademark, but it's not an automatic thing. And you have uh, design patents and utility patents. Uh, and with utility patents, you can get provisional, as I mentioned earlier, which gives you like a placeholder for a year. You pay less, it's less paperwork, it takes less time to do it, but if you don't file a non-provisional, a, a real utility patent with after a year, just like one day less than a year, then you lose your rights. But a lot of people do like the uh, advantages of the provisional. And of course, uh, if you file in the United States, you don't get rights in foreign countries. And there are these two things, the Madrid Protocol for uh, Trademarks, there's also the Berne Convention for Copyright, and the PCT, which are ways for you to get rights in several hundred countries, you know, through one process, instead of having to apply to each single one. And then I just mentioned quickly what copyright is. So uh, you get the copyright, in theory, as soon as the work is created. So as soon as you write some code, you have a copyright in it. Uh, but as I mentioned, registration gives you the constructive notice and the statutory damages. Uh, and the disadvantage of copyright, why it might be better to get a patent on the code or something like that, 
is that you only get protection against um, people who copied with knowledge of your um, invention. Uh, if somebody created the same piece of code in another country two years later, and they you couldn't prove that they had access to your stuff, then they would get away with it. Um, whereas with patents, it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't have to show anything. You just have the patent first. Um, the term of copyright, a lot of people wanted to know that. So that is generally 70 years plus life of the author. And if there's two people, it could be many people, but we'll just start with joint ownership as two people, it would be the second person to die. So it could be longer. Uh, and the only other point I made about the copyright is if you have many authors, it does help to agree in writing when you're setting it up as to how you're gonna do licensing. Because otherwise, any of you can go ahead and get a licensing deal and sell your copyright, that's fine. But you have to share the money with all the other people even though they didn't do any work. Uh, that doesn't seem very fair, but that's the way the law has as a default. So it encourages you to contract around that. Trademark and trade dress, uh, you have to have a good service that's sold to the public, uh, and the term could potentially be without limit. A Coca-Cola has lasted for a long time, 100 years, as long as one pays fees regularly. So of course, it has to be commercially worth your while to keep doing that. And the thing I mentioned there, ITU, what that stands for is a small company has a <coughs> brand, a title, that they want to protect for a product, but they haven't actually sold any of it. They can still get a trademark through this intent to use procedure, and that's good for six months and can be extended for up to 24 total months with additional uh, payments uh, before you have to actually start selling it. And that's a change in the last 20 years and it correlates with what the other countries do, and it makes it easier to get a trademark even if you haven't sold it in commerce. And I mentioned also that if you have the trademark, you can go after people who registered the domain names but haven't got the trademark, but there are different things that you should do both. Quick question. On yes. the um, copyright, it states that uh, you can get statutory damage. Yeah. What if you do not have a registered copyright um, but you have obvious proof that you've been plagiarized, for example, is it much more difficult to get damage uh, claim without the official registration? Well, I mean, sort of, the way you phrased it, you have obvious proof, it would be fine, you win. Okay. But oftentimes, you don't have as much proof as to how much it was worth to you. I know, they, they copied it 10 times, you want to assert each one of those was worth $1,000, difficult to prove it. Whereas statutory damage is, is a set number and it's pretty high. So it's like definitely more useful for, for small companies. If you get to a large size, it's different. So the quick question, if, if you have a, if you have registered a name that, that has a potential as a trademark mm -hmm. and nobody else has any obvious claim to, any way to prove any prior claim to it, is that pretty much adequate protection that you then be able to be sure of having that as a trademark? I would say yes. Uh, the main thing with trademark is that the United States recognizes common law trademark, the TM thing. So there might be some company out there that never bothered to register and has a very small circulation in, say, Seattle only. But uh, they would still be able to maintain their rights against your registration. Uh, and that's, I guess, why you might hire someone because they have access to a database of all these companies. But uh, certainly, if, if there was nobody else who could show ownership, you get it. That's the way it works. Yeah. Quick question. The material you're covering tonight, is it only true for corporations or also for bloggers? It would be true for bloggers, but there is a part where I'm going to explain why you should have a corporation. But yes, it would be true for bloggers. Yes? And what about uh, international? How difficult is it to uh, get a domain back uh, or a dot-com version of that domain if another company has a variation of your copyrighted name, uh, has that as a dot com. Well, um, it should be relatively easy to do in the United States and most other countries, but I guess there are, certainly are some countries where it would be more difficult, such as China. Yeah. So just really quickly, the types of patents, utility, which I think most people have heard of and that's what most people talk about, design, and uh, plants. You can also get a patent on plants. I don't know if anyone would want to do that here, but that's you know, just an option. Uh, so the thing that most people talk about is design and utility, and they came up in the uh, recent Apple case, which they won over a billion dollars, so definitely uh, can be very useful. So the uh, requirements for utility patent are that it must have utility, which is 
almost always very, very easy to prove. Uh, statutory subject matter, uh, there have been issues over whether or not genes are patentable. That might be an example of that. But generally, that's not an issue. Uh, novelty, you, the uh, way to get novelty is you just show that there's no prior art reference, no patent or provisional patent or publication or anybody using something that's exactly the same as what you were doing. And the thing that almost everyone runs into when you file something with the patent office is this non-obviousness section where they try to take several different uh, publications and several different prior uh, applications and published patents and say the combination of them makes your thing obvious. And that's pretty much what you go back and forth on for several years to show that that's not true. The uh, components of the patent uh, include drawings. Technically, they don't have to include drawings, but they always do. And uh, specification, uh, which would be a detailed description of the, basically the drawings invention. Uh, the claims, in the provisional you wouldn't need claims, you could add those later, in the non-provisional that's part of it. And they are used in court to determine what the patent scope is. You have a declaration of inventorship which says you're the person who came up with it, and you pay a fee, and you file a patent. Uh, you don't actually have to have a prototype. So for instance, if you had an idea for a software um, plugin, and you hadn't actually reduced it to practice, it wasn't totally working yet. You could still get a patent as long as you can describe sufficiently well how it would work. I guess, assuming that you turn out to be right. And um, you can immediately put patent pending on anything that you sell, uh, even if it's only a provisional patent, and that um, looks good uh, and might scare your competition a little bit. Uh, then you have this information disclosure statement is required as any prior art, which means if you know of any publications or patents, you're supposed to disclose them to the office. Uh, and so prosecution is this term that we use, to, which refers to getting a patent, obtaining a patent from the office. And you go back and forth with office actions, which is where they send you a rejection and then you respond. And typically it takes around three years, uh, can take longer for more complex things. Then you receive a notice of allowance, you make a payment of an issue fee, and you receive a patent. Uh, you can then, uh, if as long as within a year of your first filing, a year of the provisional, a year of the non-provisional, whichever you decide to do, uh, file the PCT, you will eventually get rights in uh, lots of foreign countries. Assuming, of course, that you pay the fees. But it is an easier way and costs less than filing all the individual countries. Uh, so the provisional patent, you have a cover sheet, you have a disclosure of the invention to be claimed in the later filing. That's the key part. You must not say something there and then try to add something later, then that will disqualify you. But as long as you disclose it one way in the provisional and the same exact way in the non-provisional, that's fine. Only costs $125 for small companies. Will cost even less starting in March when they do the micro-entity fee adjustment, but they haven't done that yet. Um, and as I mentioned, the disadvantage, I guess, of the provisional, assuming that you had the money to do the non-provisional and you knew exactly what you wanted, you should do the non-provisional because the provisional is not examined. It's just a placeholder for one year, but it does serve as priority for the non-provisional. So if you file a non-provisional within a year, you get the date as if you would have filed it when you filed the provisional. So as I mentioned, the disadvantages are, assuming that you have the money right now, its total cost is higher, but you have more time to pay. So uh, the other thing is, after March 16th uh, next year, I think everyone's going to start doing provisional applications. Well, why would that be? Well, because of the new laws that happened in September of last year, and they're going to go into effect on March 16th, uh, it will be first to file. So whoever gets to the office first and files will win. Unless, of course, you could prove that they stole it from you. But that's pretty hard to do. So most people will file something right away as soon as they have an idea that they're reasonably sure they want to patent. Um, and then the advantages are it's a vehicle for inventors to get some protection before they publish an article or before they disclose the idea publicly. It's useful when they need time to raise the funds for the non official. So I did mention that uh, statutory subject matter can be an issue, and the examples of that would be in software and business processes, which are patentable even now. Uh, there have been cases like the Bilski case, which was rather famous with the Supreme Court, but the result of that case was they said that a business process claim can, is possibly patentable if it's related to a particular apparatus or machine. It's not totally abstract. And it, 
and or it transforms the particular article into a different state. And so that was fine. The reason why Bilski lost is that their thing was just too abstract. And the other things quickly to point out about patents, you have to sue in federal court because it's a federal thing, you can't sue in state court. So suing is more expensive uh, and you have to prove that they're violating each and every element of the claim or claims or that they're using an equivalent structure. But uh, I guess the thing with infringement is you should still get a patent because you're hoping to get investment when those people would pay these costs if somebody infringed and they would sue them. Um, so you shouldn't be deterred by the fact that it costs a lot of money. What for about, that part. I'm sorry, what about copyright infringement? Is that really expensive or can you do it on retainer? That's significantly less expensive, um, but... Do they collect up front? They, they do probably collect up front, unless I guess you, they were really sure that you were going to win. So this was just the thing I mentioned earlier, um, March 16, 2013, things are going to change, and there's going to be a lot of various changes with post-grant review, inter-powers review, derivative proceedings, all very technical things. And this was something <coughs> I thought was relevant, which is if you had enough money, uh, 2400 for a small entity, you can get what's known as prioritized examination. You've been able to do that since September 26th of last year, and that means that they will give you a patent or deny it within a year which is significantly faster than usual. And there are these new micro-entity fees that should be established within a year. They have to be established within a year, but my sources tell me they're going to happen in March. And uh, all the fees increased uh, as of September 26th, uh, and there's this additional fee if you file on paper, but nobody files on paper anymore, so that doesn't really matter. It's just to encourage you not to. Now this was my other point. Uh, I would think if you really think that you have a great website and you want to commercialize it, that you should create a legal entity, and this would be because you limit your liability, it makes you more credible in the marketplace, and it's a place to assign your intellectual property. It allows you to have multiple owners. The advantage of the C corporation is that venture capitalists will only invest pretty much in C corporations, particularly if they're in Delaware. Uh, you can convert an LLC or S corp to a C corp relatively easily, not the other way around as easily, uh, and you can transfer something from Massachusetts to Delaware relatively quickly. Um, the advantage of setting up if you're in Massachusetts and you're doing business only here in Mass is you don't have to pay a resident agent as you would have to pay in Delaware. And you don't have to qualify to do business in Massachusetts as a foreign company. They call it foreign even though it's a different state in the United States. So that would be the issues on that. This is my last little slide, just quickly covering the situation. Uh, copyright, uh, you have to show that the other person's stuff is substantially similar to your stuff in order to prevail. Domain names are separate from trademarks, you need to get both. Trademarks would help you get the domain name, but you do have to do both things. Uh, the design patents could be relevant in a website, because it protects the look and feel of the website, and certainly Apple had a few of those. And trade dress is very similar to design patents in terms of the look and feel aspect, but there's no built-in time limit as long as you keep paying fees. Uh, the trademarks mentioned the intent to use and how that can give you more time to start actually selling the goods. Um, and that would be pretty much it. Yes? With respect to copyrights and licenses under Creative Commons, how is that different from the kind of copyright that you're discussing here? Well, uh, Creative Commons is a uh, invention that a lot of people use where you have a website and you want to encourage people, uh, as long as they attribute it to you, to use your content. And a lot of people do that and that's, that's very much a good thing to do as long as you're not looking to make a lot of money off your content, you, you should do that. Well, there are many, many different types of Creative Commons licenses, some mm -hmm. of which allow commercial use or non-commercial use, and others which don't. Right. But so my question is, what's the degree to which you're protected with respect to your rights if you license under Creative Commons as opposed to this? I mean, well, this what you're saying is you, you, you put your mark on, you say copyright, and then you actually also apply for a copyright. I would put, say, put the copyright notice on, start the registration process, put a watermark on the images so people, if they copy them, it has your name right on it. So I probably would not want to do that. And if someone did do it, then people would see that it's your stuff and want to go back to your website and see more of it. That kind of thing. But certainly, Creative Commons is a great thing, but you're right, there are a lot of different versions of it. You need to read it closely. It's like open source. There's lots of different versions of open source. 
some you can use in a commercial way better than you can use other ones. You'd have to just read it over really closely. But these are more clear, I guess, is why people do them. Yes? If you have an online services-oriented company as opposed to, you know, actual products, yeah. and it's just yourself, is an individual proprietorship sufficient? Like an LLC, you think? Uh, yes. Yes, I think, think if you're just one person, you're not trying to hire other people, you're not trying to expand, I think you should do it because other people as you might get sued and maybe your personal assets would be on the line so you protect yourself by having an LLC but you don't really need to have a sequel if you're just one person and you don't plan to expand. Okay. Yes. Super information back talk. Uh, would you be possibly uh, up there making the slides available on SlideShare or your website? Or oh, something? sure, yeah. Absolutely. Where, where, where will we find them? Let's put it on SlideShare for the Super. Do you have a contact section? Yeah. We'll link up to it in the comments on the site right. instead right. of email after the fact. Thank you. It'll be there. Yes. We do, <coughs> excuse me. We do a an online news <coughs> when I clear my throat, we do an online newspaper for Bedford and mm -hmm. we have a lot of people writing for us and now we are gonna have to get agreements from them, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And we're also applying for nonprofit status because we'll be a five oh one C three corporation. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, there is something called the patch, which we understand is a quite rapacious AOL deal that comes and does little online newspapers and steals mm -hmm. stuff like ours. Mm -hmm. um, if they get up in Bedford before we get going, what can we do to protect ourselves in the meantime? Um, basically, I've heard of that place, and they do do that. Every town seems to have that, at least not Bedford yet, but they probably will try to do that. Uh, I would suggest that you display copyright on your website, that you watermark the images so they can't take the images without people knowing it's from you, and uh, that you start the registration process. Because uh, uh, copyright is not too expensive. Uh, you know, eventually it might add up to a couple thousand dollars, but initially just a couple hundred to get the process rolling. So I think you should do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Uh, are you aware of any examples trademark recognition uh, by the U.S. government, and then proactively uh, being challenged by somebody that was using that campaign prior to the, the issuance of the trademark. Yes. That's possible? That does happen. Um, and it all becomes a question of proving use, you know, who was the first to use it, which is another reason why the intent to use is a great thing. You could have not sold it to anybody, file an intent to use, somebody else starts selling it three months later, and you eventually get a registered trademark, you would be able to shut them down because you filed first, even without use. Whereas it used to be before, and it's still, of course, valid, that if you can show prior use, you win. Um, in order to file a trademark, you need to be a business or you could be an individual? Most every one I've ever seen was a business, but like if you're a celebrity, they do that I think they do it through their business. So pretty much, yeah. Almost Sorry, a um, if someone has had a copyright infringement on their website content, mm -hmm. I've heard that um, attorneys are willing to send, if they can contact the, the person, to send a cease and desist letter prior to having the victim shell out money for attorney fees. Um, my question is, those cease and desist letters coming from, not from a court, but from an individual attorney, is that just a scare tactic, or does it have some, some hold upon whoever receives it? The effect of such a letter is to definitively put you on notice that the other person has these rights, or they assert they have the rights, so that if you ignore it, and then you lose in court, they can treble the damages, saying that you are a willful infringer. That's basically why they do it. Thank you all. Thank you.